Chairman is um, the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and, and Community Service and former Dean of the Law School at Chapman University. Uh, we have uh, Bob Kaufman, who's the Dachshund Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. And then we have Ian Milheiser, uh, who's a senior fellow at the Center uh, for American Progress. So without further ado, I turn it over to John. Thanks, Scott, and thank you all for coming out on noon on a, on a beautiful day. I've been here now long enough to experience 70 degree weather and 20 degree weather. <laughs> all in a single turnaround. Um, we didn't bring our snow boots up though, so we're having, having a little str struggle. Um, so the, the, the topic is rather broad, uh, and it, it's not quite clear the meaning of the question. In one sense, we've had a divided Congress uh, since 1791, since 1789, when we adopted the Constitution. There's a House of Representatives and a Senate, deliberately divided as a check on legislative power. Uh, the Senate would only being elected every six years, even back then, not even by popular vote, but by, by the state legislatures, to ensure that the, the separate subsidiary sovereigns that we know as the states had a role to play in the national councils and uh, could prevent the national government from consolidating too much power as itself to be tyrannical. I mean, so this is the original divided Congress that our Constitution sets out, and we've tweaked it a little bit. We no longer have state legislatures electing the, the senators. We have direct election of the Senate, but the Senate, with its longer terms and broader base of constituency, still serves uh, that kind of slow down the popular passions that might take control in any given two-year election cycle uh, uh, to uh, make our democracy more a representative democracy, a deliberative democracy, rather than a raw passion democracy. And so we still have that divided Senate, but I suspect that's not what the topic was really aimed at. Um, <laughs> I suspect we're more talking about party division rather than uh, I institutional or structural division in the Congress. Um, and I taught a class yesterday over on main campus here uh, on George Washington's farewell address. And it reminded me of uh, one of his warnings to his fellow citizens as he was departing the public stage. Avoid parties, he said. The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, has perpetuated the most horrid enormities. It's itself a frightful despotism, and it leads eventually to a more formal and permanent despotism. Uh, he goes on and says, it serves always to, uh, to distract the public councils um, and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies, and false alarms kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasional riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption. <laughs> Anybody that says George Washington wasn't wise hasn't read <laughs> that passage or prescient. Um, but what is, what is real effect? Well, obviously, the, the immediate fact is uh, investigations from here until eternity. Uh, uh, the, the Mueller report came out and put end to end of one investigation, but that's not going to end the investigations in the House. In fact, the White House Counsel's Office is staffed up with a lot of white-collar criminal lawyers who can deal with subpoenas and depositions and all of those things because they know uh, what's coming down the pike. They're not, they're not guessing about this. They've been told you know, pretty, pretty uh, uh, overtly. Um, more troubling, though, is the party faction between the House and the Senate on the ability to um, get through some legislative fixes on things that we all agree need to be addressed. Um, the, the incurring of, of now 21, close to 22 trillion in, in national debt, a $200 trillion unfunded liability in our entitlement programs. Uh, uh, the longer we wait to address those things, the more painful and difficult it is going to be to address them. And this divide, look, I mean, a unified Congress on party uh, uh, couldn't do it, either when the Democrats were in control under President Obama or the Republicans under control over the last two years. The notion that we can address such serious concerns with this divided Congress goes out the window. <coughs> Um, uh, 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 fixes on streamlining the legal immigration process and addressing in a comprehensive and thoughtful way the illegal immigration problem, unlikely to get through either. Now, the temptation, therefore, is going to be for the executive to do more and more on his own. 
um, after the Republicans con took control of the House or the Senate during Obama's administration, President Obama famously or infamously said, I have a phone and a pen, I don't need you, I can do this on my own. Uh, some have accused President Trump with his national uh, emergency order on the border of doing the same thing. I would say that I think there's a difference. Uh, some of the things that President Obama did had no statutory basis for it. President Trump's executive order does have a statutory basis for it. Um, one of the things I think we're going to see as a result of that is a shifting in um, devotion to one of the old core doctrines of constitutionalism called the non-delegation doctrine. Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1, very deep inside the Constitution. Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1 says, the legislative powers here and granted are vested in Congress. And that's long been understood as requiring that only Congress can do lawmaking. They can pass off authority to executive agencies to fill in the blanks on technical stuff, but they can't pass off or delegate the fundamental lawmaking um, uh, decisions, the policy judgments that have to be made. That non-delegation doctrine has been a dead letter in constitutional law for about three quarters of a century. Um, but now I find folks on the left wanting to revive it as a way to address the uh, uh, broad delegation of power under the National Emergencies Act that President Trump has now used on the border wall issue. So we might find as a result of the current divided Congress and, and President Trump's exercise of delegated lawmaking power, a revival of this core constitutional doctrine on non-delegation. That, that would be fascinating. Um, what I hope we don't see though is the inaction from Congress leading to an executive, either this one, the last one, or the next one, to just take lawmaking power into their own hands and do what they want. That starts crossing the line from an executive function to a tyrannical or despotic function. And Washington had something to say about this as well, and I'll close with this. Separation of powers was, his, uh, was one of his points uh, raising a red flag. Keep it in mind, separation of powers. Each branch must confine itself to their assigned constitutional spheres. If the people think we got the balance wrong, let us amend the Constitution. But let there be no change by usurpation. Um, because even if the usurpation is, is useful in a particular instance, President Obama's DACA or DAPA programs for people that liked those programs, um, the bad precedent set by the use of it, even to accomplish a good policy end, uh, will ultimately destroy free government because we will no longer be bound by the structural limitations on our power. So the divided Congress, I hope, will not serve as an incentive for any president to just say, we're going to take the lawmaking powers on our hands because somebody's got to do something about this particular problem and the Congress is so divided, can't do it themselves. So I'm just going to take the power on my own. All right? I think that would be ultimately a very dangerous thing and it would essentially mean the end of constitutional government in the United States. So let's keep vigilant watch on that as we go forward because I suspect given the divisions in the country, we're in for a lot of divisions in Congress for a long time to come. Thanks so much. <laughs> Uh, John, I've been here uh, several more times than you have, so what you find perplexing, what do the topics of the panels mean? Th that's the norm here. <laughs> um, I once um, speculated publicly here that the people who came up with the titles did so after a Grateful Dead reunion, <laughs> uh, celebrating being 420 friendly. Uh, Everybody has their favorite. For me, uh, the stupidest title uh, that, that showed biblical illiteracy was uh, one year, second year here, what would Jesus cut in the budget? That, 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 was, that was the top one. So comparatively, this, this is a model of concision and clarity. <laughs> a separate, uh, divided government. I, I actually think that our situation of divided government shows that the system uh, worked as the Founding Fathers intended it to work. Uh, our, our system is not built for speed, I think for very good reason. Uh, go back to Federalist Paper Number 10. Uh, what our structure is supposed to do is refine popular opinion by deliberation and choice. And I think divided government is not something unusual, but if you go back to uh, the Republicans recapturing uh, Congress in 1946, 
divided government is actually the norm rather than the exception. And the reason we have had divided government is because it is a reflection of you and the audience, not this audience per se, but the country at large. Uh, we are divided, we are ambivalent, and uh, let me give you, for our current situation, a book written in 1998 uh, by a very good historian, Gertrude Himmelfarb, very prescient. Uh, it says, one nation, two cultures. This was written in 1998. And what Gertrude argued is that this country is fundamentally divided, nearly 50-50, on many fundamental things. And if you look at the uh, outcome of presidential elections since 2000, uh, that has uh, been borne out by the electoral results and divided government being the norm rather than the, the exception. Uh, I actually think our current system, our current uh, uh, situation of divided government is very healthy for the upcoming election of 2020. Uh, most elections in the United States, most of the time, happen between the 40-yard lines, that there's a basic acceptance of general premises, and we're debating a little more of this and a little more of that. In the political science literature, uh, Walter Dean Burnham and others have laid out the idea in their own way, Everett Ladd, uh, of something called critical elections where the stakes of the elections are much more fundamental. Uh, 1860, 1932, some people more debatably say 1980. Uh, I think 2020 is closer to being one of these critical elections than uh, is typical in American politics. We have on the table, I think, two fundamentally different visions of the American social contract, uh, of America's role in the world, and the relationship among government, state and local, and the private sector at home. And this divide in Congress and the liveliness of the divide reflects a fundamentally divided country on the fundamentally different directions that we should take. So what I think you can expect both parties to do, and I think it is legitimate, is tactically, in using the prerogatives of the branches they control, to clarify to the American people what the stakes are in the election of 2020. I think there's one advantage that the Republicans do have because of the outcome of 2018 uh, that most of you won't like, which also gives me pleasure. <laughs> In the area of the judiciary, because the Republicans actually picked up a seat in the Senate and got rid of some of our waverers, Trump, if there is a Supreme Court nomination on the table, is going to have an easier time, whether you like it or not, than the mathematics before the outcome of the 2018 election. And before you lament that uh, we are uh, uniquely saddled with problems and that the adoption of a different type of system, a parliamentary system, is the remedy that ails us, take a survey around the world, think again. Uh, I would make the case to you that uh, compared to the current situation in Great Britain, a parliamentary model offered as an alternative, uh, we look like the paragon of clarity and government efficiency. Uh, survey the rest of Western Europe. Look at President Macron's approval rating. Look at the difficulty that in theory, if you think the electoral college is gonna solve the issue of fragmented politics, think again. If you look at the French system, which um, in political and military affairs is a God's cautionary tale for what you shouldn't do, this is not so much a systemic problem as a problem of the democratic free world being fundamentally divided on fundamental is issues. 
So instead of something to lament, this divided government actually, I think, reflects A, the best of what the Founding Fathers were trying to do in Federalist 10, because we are bitterly divided, and until we have a consensus or a near consensus on which way the country should be going, you don't want dramatic social policy shoved down people's throat on 50% plus one. Uh, this is another reason that we should be thankful for the founding fathers we have and let the election of 2020 come and let the most compelling agenda win. So I want to start by agreeing with uh, two things that John said. I'm really happy you read that Washington quote. I actually had a quote written down from our second president, uh, which is a little briefer. This is John Adams saying, there's nothing I dread so much as a division of the republic into two great parties. So I, I think there's agreement at this table that the framers were adverse to partisan politics. And as I'll explain in a second, they thought incorrectly that they were designing a system that would prevent the emergence of political factions. Um, and then the other thing I want to agree with John on, this will become relevant on my remarks, um, later on in my remarks, is that um, I agree that the Supreme Court is likely to aggrandize power within itself um, that historically has been held by the executive branch and specifically the executive branch agencies. Um, John and I will probably disagree on whether or not that's a good thing or whether the Supreme Court has a lawful basis for doing so. But as a descriptive matter, I think that he is right that the Republican majority on this Supreme Court is very interested in the project of shifting power from the executive branch to the judiciary. Um, and so what are those two, two things, uh, those two points of agreement that I just mentioned mean? Um, as I said, the framers thought they were designing a system of government that would be resistant to parties. Um, the way that James Madison put it in Federalist 10, which you mentioned, Robert, is that uh, our Constitution would have a tendency to break and control the violence of faction. Now, anyone who has seen the musical Hamilton knows that that, did, that is not how it, it worked. You know, we had factions emerge almost immediately within President Washington's cabinet, and of course, Hamilton's um, Federalists and Washington's Republicans wound up becoming the first iteration of a two-party system that has continued throughout American history and for various reasons is inevitable in any system of government that uses the method of counting votes that we do. Um, another thing that I think the framers did not understand is that, and this isn't an ironclad rule in politics, but this is a tendency that you see in polls, is that when times are good, the president tends to get the credit for that, regardless of whether the president has anything to do with those good times. And when times are bad, the president tends to get the blame for it, regardless of whether the president has anything to do with why you have bad times. So you have a system that was not made to be resistant um, to the emergence of parties. You have a system which has an unusual number of veto points compared to our peer democracies, meaning that there are many different places that one faction can capture that will allow it to prevent policy change from happening. Um, and then on top of that, you have a system where regardless of who is actually you know, to credit or to blame for things that happen, the president tends to be the person whose polls rise or fall based on the fortunes of the nation. And that creates an extraordinarily perverse incentive for the opposition party. Because if you're the opposition party, you control at least one veto point. That means you want to do everything you can to sabotage the president. Because you know, it, 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 you're not the ones who are going to get blamed for it if things go bad. The president will. It, you know, it, it creates an extraordinarily perverse incentive. I think that Mitch McConnell was an innovator in this field, but both parties, um, both parties have this perverse incentive to do what they can to ensure that things go badly under a president of the other party because that president will, will, will tend to bear the blame. And that means that our system will tend towards dysfunction 
because it is very easy for the opposition party to capture at least one veto point. And once they do, they have every incentive to make government dysfunctional. It also means, and this brings me back to that second point of agreement I, I raised with John, that the Supreme Court is likely to aggrandize power within itself, that despite the fact that Congress is going to be tend towards dysfunction in our system, and despite the fact that the executive branch is in the process of being depowered, and I expect that process to accelerate rapidly, there is one branch that is governing right now. Um, and this is just a list I came up with off the top of my head, so I apologize that it's not comprehensive. But in the last 10 years or so, the period where we've seen um, a real emergence of congressional dysfunction, the Supreme Court has eliminated all meaningful limits on campaign finance donations. It gutted a key provision of the Voting Rights Act. It raised the amount of proof that voting rights plaintiffs need in order to prevail in a case alleging racial or intentional racial discrimination to be so high that it's now virtually impossible to prove. It made it significantly harder for victims of age discrimination to prevail in court. It weakened protections who were retaliated against um, because they file a civil rights complaint. Um, this next one on my list is one of my favorite examples of evil. So um, under our sexual harassment law, if you are harassed by a supervisor, your company is automatically liable for doing so because that, of that power that supervisor wields over you. The Supreme Court defied the word supervisor so narrowly that almost no one qualifies. At the time the court handed down this decision, my boss's job title was senior vice president. And under the Supreme Court's definition of a supervisor, he doesn't count. Um, they held that, um, oh, this one's a fun one. So uh, there's this thing called forced arbitration. If you get a job, your employer could say, as a condition of taking this job, you have to sign away your right to sue the employer and it said go to a corporate run arbitration system where all the data shows that plaintiffs are less likely to prevail and when they do prevail they receive significantly more money. Oh and by the way that can happen to you when you sign up for a bank account or get a credit card or check your parent into a nursing home as well. Um, so the Supreme Court significantly expanded that. Um, they've allowed businesses to immunize themselves from both um, employer and consumer class actions. They've defunded public sector unions. They've effectively eliminated the president's power to make recess appointments. And just in case you think it's all bad, they also recognize that uh, same-sex marriages are protected by the Constitution. So regardless of what you think of the items on that list, it is a long and very consequential list of policy changes that is more ambitious than the policy shifts that, we've, that Congress has able, been able to pass during this period of congressional dysfunction. And I think that should bother you. I think it should bother you that the branch that is now the locus of policy making in the United States of America is the only branch that is unelected and the only branch where its members serve for life and cannot be removed for incompetence. You know, I, th I think, I think we, we are entering into a troubling era. I'll, I'll, I'll say one more thing, which is say it, didn't, it wasn't always this way. There's a really interesting study by a, perfect, by a professor named uh, Rick Hassan um, who found that over the course of the last 40 years, the number of congressional overrides, meaning that Congress passes a statute which in some way overrides a Supreme Court decision, has diminished by 80%. So there used to be a dialogue between Congress and the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court would interpret a law and then Congress fairly frequently, about 12 times every two years, would step in and say, hey guys, you got it wrong, let's do it this way instead. That is not happening anymore. And again, I think we should be very troubled if we believe in a system where government's just powers flow from the consent of the governed where the primary driver of American policy right now is the only branch of government that is unelected and unaccountable. Well, I wanna thank the panelists for their uh, thoughts on the topic. Uh, just as a reminder, you can use the app. I am getting the questions on the app, so. Um, but also, 
There's a few folks walking around with cards. Um, if you want to write a card down, I can get that as well. Um, I've already had one, uh, actually a couple of very related questions, so I'm going to kind of consolidate them a little bit. Uh, and it, it gets to, of course, what all of you are, have been alluding to or even explicitly talking about, which is, um, in, in, in essence, the way the institution operates, the way Congress itself operates. And there's this very common perception. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a perception among uh, the public. It's, it is prevalent in the literature on Congress that it is a fundamentally different institution today in the way it functions, in the way it operates, in the way it passes legislation or doesn't pass legislation than it was a generation ago. That you're not seeing the kind of um, work across the aisle that you generally would see or saw to a greater degree than you do today. And so major pieces of legislation, of course, things like the ACA or the, uh, the Trump tax cuts, those kinds of things, are happening from uh, only one party. Right? There's no buy-in whatsoever, not even minimal buy-in, by the other party. Um, and what we're seeing, of course, part of this is there's no buy-in at the committee stage when they're, they're early on in the formulation of the legislation. Um, there's no cooperation between the parties when we're negotiating, either between the chambers, um, as Bob was alluding to before uh, in his comments, and then uh, negotiating with the White House. Is, th th here's the question, but you can take it where you want. Is this a permanent change? Are we never going to see the, our, 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 our parents' Congress? Are we never going to see the Congress where there were moderates of either party and they were, you could rely on them for um, working on major issues and perhaps that's where some of the votes for passage were going to come from? Or are we just in a fundamentally different era? Well, well, two things to that. One, I think you're uh, romanticizing a bit the tranquility of previous Congresses. <laughs> but, but secondly, the, the paradox is that this is the type of system that political scientists yearn for in, in the 1950s. If you go back to Frank Soroff and the critics of the system that you've described so favorably, it was that unlike Europe, we did not have responsible parties because of the anomaly of the one-party Democratic South that created a conservative Democratic uh, Northern Republican coalition after the New Deal, uh, represented by Lyndon Johnson as Senate Majority Leader working very well with Dwight Eisenhower. One of the consequences of developing the, the more responsible party system where there'd be a correlation between ideology and party is that in a divided country, when you have a responsible party system, this is the natural result. Also, I'm going to disagree with John and say the Founding Fathers, one of the few things I disagree with them about is their view on parties. In fact, I think that they structured the system better than they knew because the Electoral College, which creates an enormous gravitational pull to a two-party rather than a fragmented party system, actually is the most effective remedy consistent with uh, any effective operation of government and accountability. So while I agree with the founders on their structure, I think that uh, Edmund Burke is right that broad-based parties are the only practicable remedy to the danger of faction. And Ian, uh, uh, again, I, I think I'm going to faint. I, I agree with you that the Supreme Court should not be the dominant government institution because it's the least accountable branch. I will point out historically that everything you say about this court, conservatives said about the Warren Court in the 1960s. Yeah, yeah and I, I want to pick that on up. I never said that the Supreme Court is going to aggrandize power to itself, nor did I ever say or suggest that that would be a good thing if it did. 
Um, in fact, my statements were the, exactly the opposite. The non-delegation doctrine says the basic policy judgments have to be made by Congress, not by an unelected bureaucracy in the executive, and certainly not by an unelected life tenured uh, nine men, nine women and men on the Supreme Court. Uh, the policy judgments need to be made by the branch of government most directly accountable to the people. Congress continues to do that. The problem is their power in exercising that legislative authority has gone underground. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples of this. And th th I think this is a dangerous trend, uh, but I don't think it's permanent because I think the new tools we have, via the internet and otherwise, to um, shine light on what's really going on, I think are gonna restore or have the prospect of restoring Congress to some sense of accountability for their judgments. So a good example, the, Ameri the, um, the uh, Affordable Care Act. One of the issues was whether the uh, Barbara Mikulski amendment for preventative care for, for women health care was going to allow for the federal funding of abortion and abortifacient drugs. If it was going to do that, the stupac Democrats over in the House were not going to vote for the ACA, and it did not have enough votes to pass without them. So Senator Mikulski gets up on the floor and said, that's a damn lie being put out by the pro-life groups. That's not what this amendment does. We're talking about cervical cancer screenings and breast cancer screenings and things like that. All right, that, this is on the floor of the Senate. It then passes. President Obama issues an executive order to confirm that that's what the ACA means and what its limitation was. It gets over to the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, they ship it off to um, uh, a, a very pro-abortion organization to help craft the regulations. The first thing they do is redefine the language from, this, from the Mikulski Amendment to accomplish exactly the thing that she said could not be done under her statute. Now, tell me but Mikulski wasn't involved in that conversation. Of course she was. It went underground, though, because they knew they couldn't get it through um, publicly, and it went underground, and it wasn't the Supreme Court that did that. It was an unelected agency collaborating with, with member, like-minded members of Congress, but all underground and outside our purview. Same thing happened um, decades ago uh, with the line item veto. The American people were very concerned about this runaway spending, and they wanted to give the president a line item veto to create an additional check on the kind of graft funding operation in Congress. Um, but th our members of Congress all had to vote for it or they weren't gonna get reelected, but they deliberately wrote the line item veto law so as to be unconstitutional rather than the number of the options where they could have written such a law that was constitutional. Hey, well, we tried to get a line item veto, but you know, the Supreme Court struck it down on us. This is the kind of um, undermining of our uh, representative democracy, um, the, the, you know, where the people's will actually plays out, that has been going on for far too long. And I suspect that the internet and the ability to shine light on that is gonna start exposing some of those games and maybe they won't be able to be played so long or so, so effectively. We'll see, but that would restore if, if I'm right about this, it would restore some sense of accountability to Congress, which I think the founders envisioned where it belonged. So a few points. Um, first is like, Robert, I was really set to agree with what you were saying until you did something indefensible like defend the Electoral College. Oh, thank you. But, uh, I, I, no, no, but I'm like, relieved you disagree. Yeah, but, 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 where we, but where we do, I think, have a lot of agreement is that the, the, the sense that the error prior to this one was some magical error where everyone got along, I, I think, is inaccurate. I think instead what has happened is that our fundamental divides in this country used to be primarily on, air, on issues related to race. And so from the 1880s until 1957, there was not a single civil rights bill that passed the Congress of the United States. It passed the House a few times, but was consistently filibustered in the Senate. Um, in the past, we did not have fundamental divides, or at least fundamental factional divides, along fiscal lines. And I think the fact that we have sorted on questions of fiscal policy as, as opposed to questions of civil rights policy presents more of an existential threat to the nation. 
than you know the terrible racial pro politics of, of 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 much of our nation's history do. And the reason why is because you can have a racist nation, and while that is morally outrageous, that nation will continue to function. But if you have a Congress that can't agree to pass the bill to fund the government, or that, or you have a faction that's willing to threaten a debt default unless it gets all of its toys now, 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 then that does present an existential threat to your nation. And so I think that we see these divides coming up more often now because the divides are occurring on must-pass legislation where there just isn't a choice for Congress to sit on its hands and, and, and do nothing. Um, and I guess the other point I'll say since like this, I started off by discussing how I think that the Supreme Court has exceeded its proper role and you know, John has expressed some disagreements. Um, I think that a problem with our Constitution is that is an extraordinarily vague document. You, you know, there, there's literally a provision saying that no one shall be denied the privileges or immunities of citizenship. Doesn't tell you what that is, and just in case you're wondering what the Supreme Court precedent says, they don't know what it means either. Um, you cannot, um, police cannot conduct an unreasonable search and seizure. The word unreasonable is, uh, is not defined. You know, can anyone tell me how much process is due before the government denies you liberty. Oh, and by the way, what is liberty? So, you know, so it's a, it's a very vague document and like the solution that you often hear to go back and look at original documents and figure out what the framers thought of these terms, they were vague then too. Um, the, the argument that John and I have sort of alluded to over the power of the legislative branch to de delegate regula regulatory authority to the executive turns on your interpretation of two undefined terms in the, in the Constitution, the executive power and the legislative power. You know, and if you could tell me with specificity what those terms mean, please get, get a job on the Supreme Court of the United States because no one else knows. Um, and so we have this extraordinarily vague document. And for much of our history, the Supreme, I mean like the, 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 the Supreme, the, the sort of policy-making initiative that I described earlier is actually much less ambitious than what you saw from the Supreme Court for much of its history. You know, the, this is a court that struck down child labor laws in, in 1918. This is a Supreme Court that, using those vague words, liberty and due process, prevented nearly any progressive legis um, labor legislation from being enacted for many decades. Um, and so for many years, we struggled with the fact that when you have a vague constitution, what you're essentially doing is delegating power to the judicial branch because you have these open-ended terms that could be interpreted in any number of ways and the five people who hold a majority on the Supreme Court can just pick the one that they want. Um, and towards the middle of the Roosevelt um, administration, the Supreme Court came up with what I thought was a very, was the correct way to deal with this challenge, because I think we do not want a country where the Supreme Court is able to choose what are powers. This is a decision called Caroline Products. And what they basically said is that in almost any issue, the courts defer to the legislature. We should let democracy be the rule on almost any issue. And then there's three exceptions to this. The first is when you have an explicit provision in the Constitution. So the First Amendment is there, you can't ignore it. Um, the, second ex the second exception, the term they use is discrete and insular minorities, but that has since been interpreted to mean that when you have a group that is systematically denied an opportunity to participate equally in our politics, think of African Americans in the Jim Crow South, then that group enjoys some special protection from the courts and laws that systematically disadvantage, disadvantage them should be struck down. And then the third category, which I think is the most important, is that the court should police democracy itself. So if you have lawmakers that are entrenching themselves, if they're enacting voter suppression laws, if they're gerrymandering, if they are preventing the speech of one party from, or, you know, or if they're preventing one viewpoint from being articulated and not another view, viewpoint from, from being articulated, those are attacks on democracy itself and the courts have a special duty to step in in those cases. And I think that decision was right because we want a system where the voters are in the, are in the hot seat. We want a system 
where the where the unelected branch is not dominating every policy topic and given the constitution we have with its very vague language a supreme court can get pretty much whatever policy result it wants and it will always be able to find a textual hook that it can point to to claim that whatever outcome it wants is justified great thank you so uh, uh Another, well, a two-parter here, um, again, consolidating some questions. One, uh, some perceive that the public is not nearly as divided as members of Congress, <coughs> that we simply are not um, in two very dis uh, distant camps ideologically as, as an electorate, but that there are factors that perhaps um, create this division on Capitol Hill. So the first question is, do you believe that the electorate is far different in its ideological distribution than, than lawmakers? And second, if you do, um, what might be a solution to that? Or do we even want a solution to that? And one of the questions asked of whether or not term limits, for example, might be help with that matter. Well, one. Uh your question is sort of a, a rehashed uh, uh, version of Alan Wolf's book. And, and Alan Wolf's book, uh, A, was written at a different time, and B, uh, as a native Bostonian, uh, any book that uses Brookline, Massachusetts <laughs> a, as a representative sample of opinion in the country, I think deserves healthy skepticism. Uh, I, th I think he's wrong, although part of it is when he wrote the book. Uh, uh, events since the fin financial collapse and, and really the controversy over the Iraq War and, and the two divergent trajectories of the political parties, uh, I think confirmed that uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb's analysis of 1998 uh, is, is more prescient for better or worse. And if you want an impressionistic example, uh, I'll ask you, how have your conversations gone uh, with people who voted for Trump? Uh, on the other side, how have your conversations gone uh, with people who uh, find Hillary Clinton or um, Robert Francis O'Rourke or Ms. Ortez? We are fundamentally divided uh, in a way that I, I think is not quite the Civil War, but I think we are as fundamentally divided on fundamental issues, political economy, the role of America in the world, uh, than we have been for a very long time, and that this gridlock, if you want to understand the source of it, go home, look in the mirror, and we are the source of it because it reflects the deep divide on an almost evenly divided American people. Think about it. The election, now it used to be that elections, 40% of any electorate, if you put a dog on the ticket, they'd vote Republican or Democratic, even in a landslide year. <laughs> Barry Goldwater got 39% of the vote. Uh, George McGovern, when he lost 49 states, got 39% of the vote. We've moved now since 2000 to a system where we divided 45, 45, maybe even 46, 46, and that what determines the outcome of these elections is going to be the very small group of independents rather than the 20% uh, between the 40-yard lines that determined elections in normal times. But, but this, this issue that we're having is not a structural problem. And to Ian, who understandably looks at it in terms of structure, when you survey the rest of the parliamentary world, what political system or what, uh, what country with an open society seems to have less of a problem than we do in, in all the issues that we're describing here? And if they don't, I think we're misidentifying the source of the problem, that this, this is a reflection of, of what divides us rather than the structural peculiarities and virtues, in my view, of the American Constitution. 
you know, and I, I think there's something else going on as well. The, the, the divide of, of, among the populace is no longer a division on what we think would be the best tactics to get to the shared goals. We now have a fundamental divide on what those goals are or ought to be. And, and the analogy I'm going to give is on the question of slavery. In, in, when the Constitution was drafted, they, they had a shared goal that slavery was evil and ought to be eliminated. They disagreed on tactics and how quickly that could be done without disruption to the economy uh, f and, and a devastating destruction of the economy. A decade or two later, that changed. And the positive good argument of slavery starts being put out by John Calhoun and others. And all of a sudden, you have a divide over the goals itself, not just over the tactics or the expediency. That became a much more insurmountable divide. I think we've got a similar divide now. We used to uh, disagree on tactics, tax policy, um, well, how big or small the welfare state ought to be. But we now have a fundamental divide on what the legitimate role of government is. Is government's legitimate role, as the Declaration of Independence says, to secure the inalienable rights that each individual has prior to government? Or is the fundamental role of government to ensure a more equal distribution of wealth, a redistribution of wealth, you will? I think that question that the, the truck driver or the cat, caterpillar um, uh, mechanic asked President Obama in the 2012 election uh, about redistribution of wealth, I think was very telling. Because that shows, and, 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 and Sandy Ocasio-Cortez, uh, AOC for those, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I think she is emblematic of the fruition of that fundamental divide on the goals of government, the legitimate goals of government. And that means that the party factions, where we disagree on tactics, but we generally agree on the same ends, you can fight a lot of, a lot of battles over tactics without ripping the country apart. But when you disagree on what the end post ought to be, all of a sudden, you've got a different dynamic. And I think that's what we're living through right now. And I, I agree with, with Bob. I think the 2020 election, as the 2016 election, as 2012 and, and, and 2008 in some sense, on a, on a <laughs> scale, we're starting to tweak that divide. And, 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 and um, I, you know, uh, I, I think the way out of it is a recourse to the original founding and the documents and the Declaration of Independence where, um, where it kind of set out what that shared goal was. Um, but that kind of runs counter to about half of the population right now. So I, I think we've got a pretty rough sea ahead of us. So I'll respond with what I see in the polling data, which is that the data I've seen look asking on issues. And I will preface this by saying that if you want to predict voter behavior by looking at how they view, about, how they view issues, you are going to be wrong nearly every single time. Um, but when you ask people on issues, what the polls show pretty consistently is that on economic, issues of economic policy, we, um, there's a center-left consensus. Um, the country's very happy with Medicare, very happy with Social Security. Even the Affordable Care Act has about a 55% approval rating now. Um, on cultural issues, we are very evenly divided. Um, which is actually surprising to me when, you know, when I saw the data that would have, uh, uh, that did not confirm my priors, but that, but that is the data that I had seen. And I think that what you think about it, it makes sense because I start off by saying that voters, you can't really predict their behavior by looking at their issue, issue, provision, issue positions. You can predict their behavior by looking at their sense of identity and which identities are activated during a, political, uh, during a particular political campaign. So someone might be opposed to abortion and a member of a union. And it matters very much when they go into the polling place whether they are identifying as a Christian conservative who opposes abortion or whether they are identifying as a worker who stands in solidarity with, with their union brothers and sisters. And which one of those identities is, is, is activated can tend to be, you know, is very predictive of, of how they will vote. Um, I think the fact that we are so divided right now is a reflection of the fact that our political arguments, as much as we'd like to think that we're having high-minded arguments about fiscal policy and health policy and stuff like that, I think are much more about 
cultural divides right now. You know, you know Donald Trump was able to, uh, to turn out such a large minority of voters because he activated a certain cultural identity amongst a large segment of the white population. You know, Barack Obama was able to get turnout from African Americans that has never been seen before. In, in 2012, African American turnout exceeded white turnout for the first time in American history. And that is in part because of the cultural significance of Barack Obama. Um, so, you know, I, I think that on the sorts of policy issues where government does its most work and where government has the most business doing work, we actually have a, we actually have a, a reasonable amount of consensus. The, the, the problem is that that's not what we're voting on. Um, and and I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, you asked about term limits. I'll just give a quick answer to that. There's a number of state legislatures have, have, who have experimented with term limits, and in every case it's ended badly in the exact same way. Um, the way it has ended badly is it turns out institutional memory really matters. It turns out knowing how to get things done really matters. And if you have lawmakers that are constantly turning over, they don't have that knowledge. And that doesn't mean that like they just flounder about in the absence of the knowledge and pass laws anyway. It means that that knowledge has to come from somewhere else. So we see two things that frequently happen. One thing that, that a lot of legislatures will do is they'll appoint someone and their title will be parliamentarian. Often this individual is a former speaker of that legislature and the parliamentarian winds up operating as if they were still speaker because the, you know, the actual speaker doesn't have the knowledge with after only five years in office to know how to do the job. Um, and so like regardless of whether you think that parliamentarian is doing a good job or not, they are not elected. Um, and I think that if you believe that power should flow from elections, then you know, that's a little troubling. The other thing we see, which I think is even more troubling, is a massive expansion in the power of lobbyists. Because again, policy knowledge, institutional knowledge, knowledge about how legislative process works has to come from somewhere. And I, I think a misconception about lobbyists, 90% of the time, if you're a good lobbyist, you are providing a valuable service to members of Congress or to members of a state legislature. You know, the way that a lobbyist earns the trust of a member is by honestly answering difficult questions that that member has most of the time. And it's once they build up that trust you know, that, that, that opens up the possibility of corruption. So the, the, the fewer opportunities there are for, their, for members to be, have to say, the only way I'm going to get information on this is to go to this lobbyist. I, um, I, I think we want fewer of those. And for that reason, I, I think that term limits are, are a bad idea. I mean, there's a, there's just a simple way to term, it your, term limit your lawmaker right now. If you don't like them, you can vote them out of office. Thank you. That and Ian, that brings up an interesting point, which is a lot of debate is happening right now in Congress mm -hmm. about its own organization, particularly in the House, and a big discussion about staff right. and the de-staffing that yes. occurred in the 90s and the consequences of that. That's been, and I, I think that that's going to be a point that we're going to see a lot of change yeah. no, um, I, coming forward. Going well, forward. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I mean... You know, I, I've tried to be as above politics as I can in my remarks, but here I am going to name a villain, and that villain is Newt Gingrich. Um, Surprise. You know, Gingrich gutted many of the in-house congressional agencies whose job was to employ policy experts who could provide that expertise to members of Congress. Um, another underappreciated change that he made was that the norm used to be that when you were elected to Congress, you would go to Washington and you would spend the bulk of your time in Washington doing the job that you were elected to do. And then there would be occasional periods when you would come back to your district and interact with your voters and campaign. And Gingrich wanted to make a big show of how his new Republican majority was constantly around so you could ask them, so you could ask them questions. And I don't think that was a good change. 
I think that when members of Congress are spending 10 hours a week on an airplane, that's time that they could be spending meeting with people. It's time they could be spending learning things. It's time they could spend building relationships with their constituents. Um, and so, you know, and on top of that, you know, if anyone here has ever worked as a lobbyist, you know this. You know, you, 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 you work for weeks and weeks to get a meeting with a member of Congress's staffer on some extraordinarily complicated issue, and then you finally get that meeting, and the, you've discovered the staffer is 24 years old. <laughs> I, I mean, like, and this isn't, like, an uncommon occurrence. Like, I mean, if you, if you meet with a, a legislative assistant in a house, and legislative assistant, even though it has the word assistant in it, is a very important position that typically handles huge amounts of policy advisory for members of Congress. In the House, they don't have the budget to pay them anything. Um, and so you wind up with people who just don't have the experience to do, to, to do, to do the job. So I think that's a problem. I think that you want senior people who um, have a great deal of expertise advising members of Congress. I think that the job of legislating is hard and should be a full-time job. And you want members of Congress spending a lot of time learning about the issues that, that, that they're voting on. Um, I would like to see, you know, and this is something that would require an act of Congress, I would like to see the, uh, the budget for congressional staff to be massively expanded, because I think we are being Penny, I, I think we're being penny smart and pound foolish if we say that we're going to save money by allowing the primary advisor on tax policy or health policy, environmental policy or whatever to a member of Congress be someone who has just graduated from college. I have absolutely the opposite concern, uh, although I oppose term limits. Um, in the biographical subject of, of a congressman, Senator Henry Jackson, uh, he knew more about national security by years of study. Pat Moynihan knew more about social policy than even the best of his staffers because it takes a long time to master these subjects. One of my concerns is absolutely the opposite, that permanent staff is not accountable. You would be replicating the problem of a permanent bureaucracy, so the remedy a is not term limits because my fear is, uh, contrary to Ian's, that would actually make them uh, more prone to be hostage of an unelected, unaccountable staff. Also, I think there's a constitutional asymmetry. Uh, um, I am against the 22nd Amendment, uh, limiting presidents to two terms, and I will blame Republicans for doing this I agree by opically looking at Franklin Roosevelt. You either have Congress term limited and the president term limited so that there's symmetry, maybe even the court, or you don't have two lim term limits because if you look at the history of presidencies, this isn't a political point, this isn't a party point. Second term presidencies usually are fraught with many more failures than the first term. There are many reasons for that, but there's one basic reason I think that unites them all as soon as a president gets elected for a second term, Reagan in 84, Obama for that matter, no matter how popular you are, you have less leverage than you did the first time because you're automatically a lame duck. As a matter of practicality, I think Washington's unofficial norm is the right norm, but I think it is one of the dysfunctions of our system that the president not having the capacity at least to threaten to have political leverage has been a distortion for any second term administration regardless of the party and I'd remove that anomaly if I could and make the requirements symmetrical to term limit everybody or nobody because it's uh, a distortion to have just the presidency and not Congress and the court term limited. So, so Ian, you brought up an interesting point, mm -hmm. which is the sort of Tuesday-Thursday club, right? right? Um, that is, members arrive on Tuesday, they get basically two and a half, three days at best right. of lawmaking back home uh, to their districts. And this is almost everyone um, by Thursday night. 
um, which really constrains the time policy making, the right. time actually legislating, of course. Um, that's an interesting question. It actually uh, uh, dovetails on a question that was addressed here, right, which is are they simply spending less time socializing and getting to know one another than a previous generation? And I'll, I'll add a, 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 a slight footnote, mm -hmm. which is the, the, one, uh, the one thing we, we think about this previous generation of members of Congress in, in this way that, well, they, they simply make this choice to go home and to campaign, mm -hmm. right, to, to connect with their constituents. But remember, Congress has changed. Um, we have many more lawmakers who have spouses who work, and they have to stay home, or children. Um, they're not just all white men anymore. Um, they have families. So there is something pulling right. them home beyond the campaigning. But, but I, I guess I would say, are, are they simply not interacting in the ways that right. they used to? And that's um, coming at the detriment of yeah. lawmaking. So, so, I mean, I'll just say as a general rule, I hope this is uncontroversial, that the more time you spend at a task, the better you're going to be at it. And like the more work you put in the office, the more productive you're going to be. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, anything that is pulling members of Congress away is going to lead them to be less good at their job simply because they're putting less, less time into the job. I, I'm not as worried about the family thing because in many cases, I think the family can move to Washington with them. Now there's a question of whether the spouse, is, the spouse has a portable career, and so that, that may make it more difficult. But in many cases, the family can come. If the, if the spouse is working, they can often find the same sort of work in, 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 the, in the D.C. area. Um, but any, but I, I do want to bring up one other problem, which, which, which speaks to this issue of um, the lack of time. So if, if you walk out the side door of the Capitol, I mean, Capitol Hill is literally on a hill, so you go down a hill, and you will pass two houses. And one of those houses belongs to the Democratic National Committee, and the other belongs to the Republican National Committee. And on the top floor of the Democratic building, and I learned last year, I used to think it was the top floor, it's actually the basement now of, of the Republican building, is a room that is just a series of tables and a series of phones. And what every member of Congress has to do, on average for four hours a day, when every day that they are in Washington, is walk down this hill and walk into the building that corresponds with their party and pick up one of those phones and start dialing rich people and to ask them for money. Now, I think most people would agree that Citizens United has fostered corruption. I think there's slightly more than five people who don't believe that. The problem is that those five people all sit on the Supreme Court. But setting aside the issue of corruption, this in and of itself is a reason why Citizens United has been a disaster for our democracy, or I could put it in the language of, uh, of the law, why there is a compelling interest in not having the rule that was announced under the Citizens United decision. And it's because members are petrified that some super PAC in the final week of their, uh, the final week of their election is going to drop a million dollar ad bomb on them, and they're not gonna have enough money in their campaign account to respond to it. So they are constantly raising money. The average member of Congress spends between 30 and 40% of their time raising money. Now, regardless of whether you believe they are being bribed or not, regardless of whether you believe that the fact that they are talking to a narrow band of rich donors constantly, and that might somehow influence their policy preferences when they spend so much time talking to the same set of people, regardless of whether you believe that, if you're spending 20, 30 hours a week raising money, you are not spending it doing the job of legislating. You know, a profound driver of the ignorance of our members of Congress. And believe me, if you've ever had the opportunity to sit down with a member of Congress, you will be shocked by what they don't know, is that even if they want to know, they can't know. Because they've got to spend, if they're from a Western state, 10 hours a week either on an airplane or an airport, and they've got to spend 20 to 30 hours a week 
raising money. And when you cut out that much time, where do you find the time to read a white paper on health policy? Yeah, I, I, and, and ju just, we just have five yeah, minutes. I, so. I, I've got a bit of a different view, as you might imagine. Um, it, 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 mu it was not much easier, much more um, peaceful, when only one major corporation in the country got to decide mm -hmm. uh, uh, elections for us, on their editorial page, the New York Times, Inc., um, broadening the number of corporations that play in that game. Uh, we should like the competition. We should like the greater messages that are available out there. Look, I think the problem is not the amount of money coming into the system. It's why, why money comes into the system. And Ian said something earlier on, our Constitution is, is too ambiguous to know what it means. Well, there are some basic things that were pretty clear. Um, you know, the power to regulate commerce among the states meant it had to be commerce, trade, not agriculture, manufacturing, and it had to be among the states, not the regulate the economy wherever it exists. That was a pretty confining thing on the scope of the federal government. The power to raise money to spend was not for any project we wanted, which lobbyists now are very good at trying to get more of it for themselves. That's the whole dynamic. And, and until you address the underlying scope of what the spending power is, you're not going to address the scope of how much money people spend to try and get a piece of that $3 trillion budget. It says spending for the common defense, not the local defense, not the local police force, the common defense, and the general welfare, the national welfare, not the local welfare. There's no constitutional authority to spend to widen a road here in Boulder, Colorado, or in Rhode Island. Right? And, 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 and that expansion of the role of the federal government, which was not envisioned and is not constitutional, it was unambiguous, uh, has all of a sudden created this friend disease to spend more money to get a piece of that multi-trillion dollar pie. And until you address the size of the pie, you can do any restriction you want on the money. It's going to find a way to get in there. We have got to go to the root of the problem and quit focusing on the symptom of the problem. So, so real quick, I just want to translate what John said because I think it's useful to translate it from law to English. So he... He talked about, he, there's a provision of the, co of the Constitution called the Commerce Clause. Uh, it says that Congress can regulate commerce amongst the several states. Um, there was a period of time in the late 1800s and early 1900s where, as, as John describes, it was interpreted to say that Congress cannot, ma cannot regulate productive activities such as manufacture, agriculture, mining. They can only regulate um, the actual transit of goods. So that was, that was, uh, that that was the interpretation Commerce, that the predominated. The that, was the, that was the interpretation that predominated for about 40 or 50 years after the robber barons gained control of the Supreme no, Court. Started in 18, John, let me finish my point. You'll get your chance. Wait, and I, I want to let Bob, I'll get it. We, we only have a minute left. Uh, I want to let Bob uh, okay, yeah, So I, I will um, amplify your point. Did you know um, when the country seemed to be running well, and Theodore Roosevelt, who was an activist president, was president, he'd leave Washington, D.C. on June 1st and not come back until late September. And the government function because the government envisaged its role. The idea that the problem with Congress is that it does not legislate enough, I do not think is uh, confirmed by experience. In fact, as long as government spends so much, there's going to be, it's like rats at a dump. <laughs> If there is a lot of garbage at the dump, and if the government is the prime dispenser of money, rents, and preferences, I don't care what you do, you're going to have lobbyists, and they're going to exercise undue influence. The best way to minimize corruption in government is to shrink it to its essential, but its limited purposes. Okay. I want to thank our outstanding panelists. Thank you all for the coming.